So here we are standing on the launching pad for our course in cell biology. In this lecture, I'd like to take a moment to just introduce you to the scope of this course. What is it that we're going to be covering in the course? As well as discovering the hierarchy of life and the relative size of the cells that we're going to be dealing with, and establishing a difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And finally, how these cells maintain their internal environments separate from the external environment. Let's begin by taking a look at the two modules of the course. First of all, we'll be covering some cell biology, and then we'll move on into the genetics module of the course. During the cell biology module, we'll be looking at the chemical building blocks of life, starting at the very base, chemistry, atoms, molecules, and then we'll put all these atoms and molecules together to produce the cell. And we're going to look at cell structures and functions, and then how cells divide and reproduce. And once we understand how cells divide and reproduce, we can talk about cell communications, how they interact with each other to create a whole organism. And finally, we'll be able to venture into energy and metabolism. So how cells procure fuels in order to produce energy and exist as living systems. In the second module of the course, we'll embark on an exploration of genetics, beginning with the discovery of heredity by Mendel, and then moving on into the structures of chromosomes and epigenetics, how some material in chromosomes is modulating the expression of chromosomes themselves, and we'll move into DNA and gene expression, so transcription and translation, all the details of how we move from DNA to the expression in proteins. Once we have a good understanding of that, we'll be in a good position to move on to discuss biotechnology techniques, things like genetic engineering and DNA fingerprinting. And then finally, we'll be able to move on and look at genomics. Genomics is a huge growing field at this present time in which we'll see not only the sequence of the genome but in addition, what each part of the genome does in modulating itself. We'll be beginning with the atom, the smallest level of biology. We put atoms together to form molecules and molecules together to form macromolecules. As we have our macromolecules coming together, we'll be able to build cell organelles. Organelles will come together so we can look at the whole cell. Once we get inside the whole cell, we'll be able to investigate how those things come together to become tissues. Communication between cells is really important for them to aggregate as tissues. And beyond that, tissues come together to form organs and organs, organ systems. And then we really step outside of the human body, beyond the organism, into populations. So many of the same organism. And many organisms, just like cells interact with each other, interact to form communities. Communities of organisms come together to form ecosystems. Ecosystems come together to form biomes. And finally, at the largest level of life, we look at the biosphere. It's important to think about the relative sizes within biology because often we'll see ourselves spending time at such a small level such a microscopic level, it becomes hard to relate it to what we're learning. So atoms are super, super tiny. There's no way we could see those with the naked eye. We can't even see it under a light microscope. Even when we put 60 or so atoms together, we still can't see that under a light microscope. And even if we look at the macromolecules, which is a lot of what we're going to be spending this course on, we still can't see those. It's not until we start looking at mitochondria and bacteria that we can start even seeing those things under a light microscope. Above the level of bacteria, we can see red blood cells. They're not that much bigger because they don't have many of the components inside them that most of our cells have. But when we get up to the level of our animal cells or plant cells, we can see that there's much more complexity in them, some of which you can even see under a light microscope. 
it's not until we get up to the level of a frog egg that we could even see this with the naked eye. Before we move into the course, it's really important for us to establish what life is. Some might debate that viruses and prions are non-living, but certainly cells are living. So we're going to explore some brief comparisons between eukaryotic and bacterial or prokaryotic cells. Yes, there's another division, another type of cells called archaeans, but they're not really components of human body. We're going to be dealing primarily with bacterial cells and eukaryotic cells, and on occasion throughout this course, we'll be exploring some mechanisms of viruses. So comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, they both have ribosomes, they both have DNA, they both have cell membranes. Bacterial cells have cell walls, whereas eukaryotic cells generally do not have cell walls. Plant cells have cell walls and fungal cells have cell walls. However, animal cells lack a cell wall at all. Both cell membranes are composed of phospholipid bilayers. Both have ribosomes, although prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes are slightly different. We'll explore those in further lectures. And then in general, a eukaryotic cell is about 10 times larger than a prokaryotic cell. And as I mentioned, in addition, we'll be visiting viruses and prions briefly. Viruses, technically, they're non-living. They're composed of a protein capsid, so a protein outer coat with a nucleic acid or DNA core, sometimes an RNA core in the case of retroviruses. In addition, some viruses like the AIDS virus also have a viral envelope, which has envelope proteins studded over the surface for recognition purposes. And finally, prions. Prions have given us some questions to think about because they contain no DNA. However, their contacting other proteins can cause them to fold in a different way. And they seem to have some sorts of genetic capacities, yet zero DNA. So clearly cells have an internal environment and an external environment. And they need to maintain that internal environment distinctly from the external environment in a consistent way. So this is where we'll introduce the concept of homeostasis, which we'll revisit regularly throughout the course. In homeostasis, let's take the example of a house and your room temperature. There's a stimulus. That stimulus would be heat. The heat is detected by the thermostat or the sensor in your home, and that sensor will integrate that with what the set point should be for your house temperature. And once the house temperature has been compared, if it's too cool or too warm, we're going to have an effect. So the air conditioner or the heater are going to be the effectors, which will either heat or cool the environment. And that change in environmental temperature itself is going to feed back on the sensor. And the sensor, again, will detect this in a cyclic manner. And so there are two mechanisms for homeostasis. The predominant one in biological systems is the negative feedback loop. However, on occasion, we'll see a positive feedback loop. Let's first take a look at a normal situation with negative feedback. Negative feedback is what keeps most systems in biology in balance. Let's now move on from the house example into a body temperature example. In much the same way, we will have a stimulus. Perhaps body temperature rises a little too much. We need to keep that in pretty close check. So it's important that we have a sensor to detect that increase in body temperature. This occurs in the hypothalamus. And the sensory neurons that are entering the hypothalamus are going to care, compare that information with the set point, the 37 degrees C that our body should be maintained at. Of course, sometimes we increase or decrease a little bit around that, but it's important that we keep it right around that set point so all of our enzymes work properly. So if we're a little bit warm, the effect is that blood vessels will dilate, will have vasodilation in the skin in order to shed some heat to the environment. 
in which case our body temperature will then drop, which is the response. And that response then is detected by the sensor. On the other end of the scale, perhaps we got a little bit too cold, in which case we don't want blood at the skin. We would like the blood then to be shunted into the system. So we have vasoconstriction. With the vasoconstriction, we may even get so cold that we need to shiver. The shivering increases muscle activity, which generates heat. And that increase in heat is the response. And that response then feeds back to the sensor and shuts down all of the mechanisms that act to warm our body. So in essence, now you can see that on both ends of the spectrum, there's a negative feedback loop where the response itself feeds back negatively to shut down production of whatever it is. We could be managing blood sugar levels. We could be managing pH in the internal cellular environment. Negative feedback is going to be the mechanism that helps all biological systems manage that. There are very few examples of positive feedback in the human body. One of them is blood clotting. Another one we'll look at here is the event of birth or parturition. When a fetus is ready to be born, it pushed up against the cervix and the cervix is stretched and the sensory muscle fibers within the cervix will detect that stretching and that stimulus will be sent to the hypothalamus and integrated and the Hypothalamus will then say, well, we need to have a secretion of oxytocin in order to have contractions so that we can expel the baby. So that secretion of oxytocin is then detected by the sensor. More contractions happen, which stimulates more oxytocin, so on and so forth, until we have so much oxytocin present that the baby is expelled, and it's the expulsion of the baby that actually shuts down this positive feedback loop. So you can see a positive feedback loop doesn't really maintain anything. It escalates, 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 while a negative feedback loop will regulate and keep things within homeostasis. In order to gain a great understanding of biology, it's critical that we have a solid foundation in chemistry, at least as it applies to biological molecules. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe and diagram atomic structure, including the location of protons and neutrons and electrons, as well as explain the concept of valence so that we can move on into future lectures and understand how atoms associate to form molecules. So have you ever wondered why chemistry is so important to biology? It's the foundations of chemistry, such as where atoms are in the periodic table and what their electron arrangements are that really determine how and why other atoms are attracted to each other. So first, let's take a look at general atomic structure. We have protons, neutrons, electrons. You've probably all heard of those. To review, protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of an atom, and electrons are found in the periphery. Protons and neutrons have some mass, and electrons have barely any mass at all which is why they float around in essentially an electron cloud around the central nucleus of protons and neutrons. So protons are found in the nucleus. They're positively charged and they weigh one atomic mass unit. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus and weigh one atomic mass unit, whereas electrons weigh barely anything. Their weight is essentially negligible, and they're found in a cloud surrounding the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and have a negative charge. So protons positive, electrons negative, neutrons neutral. Atomic number is what defines an element. So let's say we're looking at carbon. It has atomic number six. It means it has six protons. And any atom with six protons is called carbon. We may see some variance in the number of neutrons and electrons. We'll take a look at some examples shortly. But atomic number 
definitely defined by the number of protons, and that defines what the element is called. We have also atomic mass. When we add the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus together, that gives us the atomic mass. Again, each of them is one atomic mass unit, and thus our atomic mass for standard carbon, the most prevalent form of carbon, is 12 atomic mass units. As I mentioned, we could have a varying number of neutrons. They're less common forms, but isotopes are the name we give for varying numbers of neutrons. Again, here we have carbon. It has six protons. It will always have six protons. But we could have carbon-13, which you've probably heard of in carbon dating. Carbon-14, we have six protons. We subtract that from 13, means we have seven neutrons. We might even see, in rare instances, carbon-14, in which case we actually have eight neutrons and the atomic mass of 14. We can also see variation in electrons. When we have either more or less electrons, we have ions. For example, if we look at sodium in its natural state, we have a balanced number of electrons and protons. However, we'll often see sodium as a positive ion, so Na+, in which case we have one less electron. We take away a negative charge, but we still have the same number of positive charges, so we end up with a positive ion. In the example below, we see we have chlorine. Chlorine is in its balanced state, where we have equal number of electrons and protons. However, chlorine sometimes likes to gain an electron, in which case we have an additional negative charge, and so there's not balance, we'll see Cl minus. And we'll see later in the next lecture how sodium and chloride might interact with each other because of these positive and negative charges. So once again, to emphasize, proton number is not going to change, at least in biology. And the proton number is going to define what element we're looking at. So the next question becomes, why would these individual atoms interact? And I bet you can see already we've talked about the plus and minus ions. Perhaps positive and negative are attracted to each other. That's one of the types of bonds we'll see. But another type of bond involves purely the electrons and the behavior of the electrons on the atom. So it all has to do with electron arrangement around the nucleus of the atom. We have energy shells, which we describe as somewhat of a railroad track around the center of the atom, although that's not really the way it works. And Electrons can occupy, in biology, one of three electron shells. Each of these electron shells also has subshells or orbitals, the S and P orbitals you may have heard of before. We're going to look at those in a little bit more detail. And there can only be, in each of those orbitals or subshells, there can only be a maximum of two electrons. So let's take a closer look at what we mean by energy levels or energy shells. Here you can see that in chemistry, there are many energy shells or energy levels. In biology, luckily, we're only concerned with the first three. The first energy shell has only one orbital. It's called the S orbital. And the S orbital has a spherical shape, only contains two electrons, and we Denote it with a spherical shape because the electrons can essentially be anywhere in the cloud around that nucleus. Now, when we move out to the next shell, we see that there are p orbitals. When we move out to the second and third energy levels, we have to consider the octet rule. The octet rule is just like it sounds. We have to have eight electrons in the second and third shells. So two in the first shell, eight in the second and third. We also have the s orbital in the second shell, but in addition to that, we have three p orbitals. Each of those can be filled with two electrons apiece. So with two in the s, and then 
two in each of three p orbitals, we could have a total of eight electrons in the second and third shell. Now, thank goodness, in biology, we only have to go to the third shell, otherwise things could become much more complicated. But in general, we just need to consider the first shell that contains two electrons in one s orbital, the second and third shells contain one s orbital, and three p orbitals, each of which can only contain two electrons, which bring us back to the octet rule. So electrons can move between the energy levels, and this is precisely what brings us to why atoms are attracted to each other and how they might want to steal electrons or share electrons. In order to fill the octet rule, we might have to gain or lose electrons. But even before gaining or losing electrons, we have our different energy levels, as you can see depicted here in our figure. And electrons can actually be pulled out away from their original shell towards a higher level, level shell. And it takes energy input to put in that. So you think about it as an excited state. When kids get excited about going to a dance, they jump around and there's lots of energy around, right? So in order to have electrons move up an energy level, they need to have some energy put in. The thought of going to the dance perhaps could be this energy. So electrons can move up their energy level. And then once we release the electron from that energy level back to ground state, there's an energy release. That energy can then be utilized to fuel biological processes. So again, we can put energy in, say from the sunlight, to excite electrons and add energy to a molecule. And we can also release energy by moving electrons closer to the nucleus and utilize that energy for cellular pro processes, as happens in cellular respiration, which we will explore later on in this course. So electrons can become so excited that they actually leave their original atom to join another atom. Or an, one atom could have such a draw for an electron that it steals it from the other. So in this case, we have A and B. When A loses an electron and gives it to B, then B becomes more negative. Because it's become more negative, we call it reduced. So the process of gaining an electron is called reduction. So gaining an electron is reduction, then the other molecule is going to lose an electron. So in this case, A is losing an electron, and thus it becomes more positive. When an atom becomes more positive, we call it oxidized. So oxidation is the process of losing an electron. Reduction is the case of gaining an electron. And these two reactions can be could, can be paired to be called redox reactions. Generally, when one thing loses an electron, another thing gains an electron. So oxidation and reduction or redox reactions are something that we're going to run into uh, frequently throughout this course. So of course we can't leave the periodic table out of the conversation when we're talking chemistry. But thankfully, as biologists, we only have to look at the first three periods, and these first three periods correspond with the three energy levels that we've talked about previously. Let's look at carbon, for example. Carbon is atomic number six, which means, by definition, it has six protons. We also see that it has an atomic mass of 12. This atomic mass tells us that there are also six neutrons. Each of those has an atomic mass of one. Six plus six is 12. So now let's look at how we can tell from looking at any atom in the periodic table what its electron arrangement might be in the energy shells. Here we're looking at the second period. Carbon is the second row down in the table. It's the second period. This means that carbon has two electron shells. The first shell is full with two electrons. The second shell is going to be full with eight, but it only has four. 
hence atomic number six. Also, we can see that carbon is in the fourth column. Again, we only need to look at the blue part. In the second period, meaning we have two electron shells, and four spots over, meaning that there are four electrons in that outermost shell presently. Now, how would carbon be most comfortable? The octet rule applies here to say that carbon would probably be most comfortable if it had its outer electron shell full, in which case it has the potential to get four more electrons in its outer shell. So in biology, there are only six major elements that we need to know, as well as some electrolytes like potassium and calcium and sodium. But the main six elements are called the sponge elements. For ease of memory, sponge makes complete sense. We have sulfur, we have phosphorus, we have oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, the cornerstone of biological molecules, and then hydrogen. So once again, luckily, we only have to deal with a certain smaller portion of chemistry in our study of biology. But our understanding of those atoms is pretty important. So in order to consider bonding arrangements, we really are concerned mostly with the outermost shell. We call this the valence shell. The number of electrons in the valence shell is how many valence electrons we have. We know that the first shell can carry two electrons, so that's illustrated in period one. Period two shows us that the second shell can be filled with eight electrons, and period three also can be filled with eight electrons. In order to fulfill the octet rule, an atom is looking to be happy having eight electrons in its outermost shell. How many electrons that an atom would like to have is considered to be its valence. So we say that an atom's valence is how many electrons it would need to satisfy the octet rule. So when an atom's valence shell is full, it's non-reactive because it doesn't need to find any more electrons to fill that shell. For example, here, helium has its innermost shell, its only shell, full with two electrons. So let's consider nitrogen. How many valence electrons does it have? We can count the electrons in the outermost shell. We know that it has five electrons in its outermost shell. But let's contrast that to the question of what is the valence of nitrogen? The valence, again, is how many would it like to satisfy the octet rule? In this case, it would like three in order to satisfy that octet rule. So it has a valence of three. It would like to find three more electrons. What about helium? It has an outer shell, one shell. It's the innermost shell. It's full with two electrons. So it has no valence. It has no desire to bond or associate with other atoms. So in the last lecture, you learned about atomic structure of the biological elements in the first three periods of the periodic table. In this lecture, we're going to move forward and look at how the electrons in the outermost or valence shell result in bonding arrangements. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the difference between covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds, as well as determine the relative strength of each bond type. Finally, towards the end of the lecture, we'll take an exploration of the pH scale and learn a little bit about acids, bases, and buffers. So to begin, let's look at covalent bonds. Covalent bonds involve sharing of electrons, so each atom has equal interest in the electrons between them. A single covalent bond involves the sharing of one pair of electrons. For example, here we'll look at hydrogen gas. Hydrogens alone have a single electron in the outermost shell, which gives them a valence of one because ideally to fill that innermost shell, they would like two electrons. So hydrogen will get together with another hydrogen and they will each share 
the pair of electrons so that the octet rule is satisfied and each has a stable outer shell with two electrons. Next, we'll look at covalent bonds sharing two pairs of electrons or a double covalent bond. In this case, we'll use oxygen as an example. Oxygen has six valence electrons, which means that to satisfy the octet rule, it would like to have another two electrons in its valence shell. It can satisfy the octet rule simply by sharing two electrons with one other oxygen. So oxygens now have two pairs of shared electrons in the valence shell, four of their own, two pairs of shared, that equals eight, satisfies the octet rule. So oxygen and oxygen, or oxygen gas, is quite stable. Now let's look at a triple covalent bond. For example, nitrogen has five valence electrons. In order to be satisfied, it would like to have three additional electrons. So a triple covalent bond involves the sharing of three pairs of electrons. It is the strongest of the bonds that we will be looking at in this course. So nitrogens, adding the three more electrons, sharing with another nitrogen, finally have eight electrons in the valence shell. Three pairs of electrons form a stable molecule of nitrogen gas. Nitrogen is really hard to break apart. In fact, there are only a hundred species of nitrogen fixing bacteria that are able to separate nitrogen gas, the two nitrogen molecules, and break that triple bonding arrangement to bring all of the nitrogen that we have in the plants that grow on earth and thus consume ourselves. So nitrogen originates from nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. The bond is really hard to break because it's a triple covalent bond, the strongest of the biological bonds. So now that we've explored covalent bonds, the very strongest of biological bonds, let's take a look at ionic bonds. Common table salt or sodium chloride is a result of the formation of ionic bonds. Ionic bonds result from first creating an ion by stealing an electron from one, and then the resulting charge of a positive and negative sticking together. So they're less strong than a covalent bond, but still fairly stable. I think of this as an example of, um, say, that having a full electron shell is like having all of the clothes on that you need, eight electrons, and having a not-so-full electron shell is sort of like that you would want to have another item of clothing on, say I'd like to put my jacket on. So in this case, we have sodium, which actually has one valence electron. It could easily drop that valence electron, say a hat, and be very happy with a regular set of clothes. Or it could gain seven more electrons, which is particularly difficult. So in this case, it's actually more willing to give up one electron. So now let's take a look at chlorine. It's the perfect pairing for sodium. It has seven valence electrons and space to gain one. Again, it wants to be fully clothed, so it's going to run on over to sodium. It's going to grab the extra electron on the outside and put it on itself. Now, sodium is quite angry. And so sodium is going to run after chlorine and try to get its item of clothing back, say its jacket. Because sodium is chasing down chloride, they're going to stick together. So the positive charge of sodium and the negative charge of chlorine lends itself to them sticking together and forming a crystalline structure. So when chlorine steals the electron from sodium, it satisfied the octet rule and also left sodium satisfied because it also has a full valence shell. Both of these molecules are now stable when they're in association. So when we stir our sodium chloride into a glass of water, the sodiums and the chlorides are literally falling apart because of the ionic charges. And shortly, we'll start to understand how water dissociates and polarity of different molecules such that sodium and chloride can actually become dissolved in water.
Here we'll start looking at hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds always sound like the strongest of the bonds. I don't know, maybe it has something to do with hydrogen bomb, but it's nothing like that. Hydrogen bonds are actually the weakest of the biological bonds that we'll be looking at in this course. So let's start by looking at water. Again, water is a covalently bonded molecule itself, but between water molecules, we're actually going to see hydrogen bonding. So taking a look at water, we see that oxygen has a valence electron, six valence electrons, and thus a valence of two. It would like two more electrons. Before, we looked at oxygen, sharing with oxygen to create a double covalent bond, but oxygen has other options. In this case, we'll have two bonds with hydrogens. So each of those two hydrogens contribute one shared electron. And now oxygen is happy with its octet rule, eight electrons in the outer shell. And the two hydrogen ions are also satisfied by sharing their electrons with the oxygen. So they only need two in their outer shell. So... We have two covalent bonds from hydrogen to oxygen and hydrogen to oxygen. So because oxygen is more electronegative, we have a polar molecule. What I mean by this is oxygen has a little bit more draw for the electrons that hydrogen is sharing with it. It's kind of greedy. And so because it's pulling electrons more towards its center, oxygen, ends up with a slightly negative charge. So it's more electronegative, which means it has more draw for the negative electrons. So the other end of the molecule would be the hydrogen end of the molecule, and the hydrogen end of the molecule has a slightly positive charge. Because the oxygen end of the water molecule has a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen end of the water molecule has a slightly positive charge, the opposite ends of the molecule are attracted to other water molecules such that the hydrogen end of one water molecule is slightly attracted to the negative end end of the oxygen end of the water molecule. So in this case, this is why water will associate and become liquid at room temperature because the water molecules are in constant motion, changing their associations. So it's less strong of a positive negative difference than an ionic bond, but a slight charge difference. When we heat water, it will evaporate and that's because we're increasing the molecular motion and that positive negative attraction is not quite enough to hold the water molecules together. So water evaporates. When we freeze water, it becomes solid because those associations between positive and negative become stronger because cooler temperatures mean less molecular motion. So we can hardly wrap up speaking about chemistry without addressing acids, bases, and buffers. The pH scale is at the base of that. We could have the pOH scale, but in biology, we generally stick to the pH scale, which is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. pH is a measure of the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration in moles in a solution. So each level we change in pH, say from 7 to 6, is actually a 10 times change or an order of 10 in magnitude more or less of hydrogen ions in the solution. So each step up is actually a very large step. If we look at the pH scale, you're probably quite familiar with the fact that lemons are quite acidic and household bleach or shampoos are quite basic. But all this has to do with is greater or lesser hydrogen ion concentration. Something that is acidic has more hydrogen ions in solution, and something that is more basic has more hydroxide ions or less hydrogen ions in solution. So water is the perfect neutral molecule because it has an equal amount of hydroxide and hydrogen in solution. Just as water molecules are constantly reassociating with each other because of the slight positive and negative charge, 
hydrogen and hydroxide ions are also separating, not quite as much, but that lends itself to being completely neutral because there's an equal number of hydrogen ions as there are hydroxide ions in the solution. And hence, water has a neutral pH of 7. Again, in biology, we stick with the pH scale rather than the pOH scale. And so we have a measure of pH 1 through 14, 1 being very acidic and 14 being very basic with water right in the middle at 7. The question about homeostasis in acids and bases, clearly we want to maintain a steady pH in any biological system. So here is an equation about the bicarbonate buffering system. And this is how we are able to maintain a constant pH in the blood while transporting carbon dioxide out in the blood because carbon dioxide will generally create a more acidic situation. So again, acids are any substances that increase hydrogen ion concentration. In this case, if we look at carbonic acid, it dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions in solution will lend themselves to increasing the acidity or decreasing pH. Remember, acidity is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration. And the lower the hydrogen ion, I mean, the lower the pH, the more hydrogen ions there are in that solution. And bases increase the hydroxide ion concentration. So in this case, bicarbonate is a base. It's going to pick up hydrogens, pulling them out of solution, and thus effectively increasing the hydroxide ion concentration. In this buffering system, we see that hydrogen ions can be picked up or dropped off. And that picking up or dropping off of hydrogen ions lends itself to maintaining a constant pH. So a buffer is anything that resists pH change because it picks up or releases hydrogen ions. So here, I think that you can see that chemistry is integral to the study of biology. It's the behavior of electrons that are around the atoms of the sponge elements that will allow bonding of molecules. We've learned about ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Again, covalent bonds are the very strongest, single, double, or triple covalent bonds. Ionic bonds are the next strongest, and the weakest of the bond types are those hydrogen bonds. So everything that happens in biology is because of these chemical reactions. Most commonly, we'll see covalent bonding in molecules. For example, here in the process of photosynthesis, where we capture energy from the sunlight and put it together with carbon dioxide and water, we're exciting electrons, taking them up to higher electron shell levels and adding energy to a molecule. We end up producing glucose. That glucose is then something that we might consume and break down and gain the energy from it. So then in that case, we're lowering electrons in their energy levels to lower shells and releasing energy that we capture in the form of ATP, which is the fuel that all of our bodies rely on to operate. So hopefully you've gained some insight into how important chemistry is to understanding biology. And you're in a position where you could explain the difference between covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds, as well as determine the relative strengths of each of those bond types in a scale of covalent, ionic, and hydrogen being the weakest of those bonds. And finally, you have a brief understanding of acids, bases, and the importance of buffers in biological systems. In the next lecture, we're going to start putting together all of these smaller molecules in order to build macromolecules such as proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and nucleic acids so that we can finally build a cell. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. <music>